Hi, I'm Tim. He's Mike. Welcome to Around the Crown and allow us to humbly introduce the real stars of the show. Today on a Rolex show, for the first time, we have nothing less than, well, Rolex watches. Mike, we're picking favorites, we're naming names. Give me your first. All right, well, first one, we're going to start uh, easy. And my first one is a Daytona, but not your typical Daytona. Now, everybody's aware that they've made a million variations of Daytona. Uh, this particular one is one I almost never see. So it looks like a beach from a distance. And remember, the Daytona Beach watches were all white gold. All white gold. And that's the thing. When you first look at it, it's like, oh, it's a yellow beach. And you're like, wait a minute, it's yellow gold. So to see this combination and this particular example, and again, every mother of pearl dial is special because it's natural and the colors vary. This particular one is as vibrant as one I've ever seen. When the first time I saw it, I was just like, I have to get that watch. I love it. It's in condition that's immaculate. It's still got an original sticker on it. Everything about this watch I love, especially that it's just super rare. And the beaches have taken off over the last couple of years. You know, when it first came out, I remember when they introduced it, it was first sold as a set. It was really hard to sell because at the time, funky colors, four watches that were, you know, $80,000 back in the day, it was a lot. And then they started selling them individually, but only for a couple of years. And then kind of got away from stone dials. And over the last five years or so, I think the appreciation of stone, natural beauty, it's just such a special watch to me. And it's really true that in the early days, especially with the Daytona Beach, with the colorful mother of pearl dials on similar models like this, it was a tough sell for two reasons. First, very expensive. Second, there was this perception before like the modern era of green and blue and burgundy and aubergine dials that colorful dial watches were for women. Yes, very much so. And back then, I mean, this was really, especially in a set, really directed, I think, towards women. But then again, you're buying a very expensive watch that, you know, a woman would want to match to something. So it's like, you know, if I had turquoise, I'm not wearing a red dress, and this yellow wouldn't go with everything. So it was a very sophisticated collector who obviously had a lot of other watches. And in women's, it was not a popular thing back then. Nowadays, you know, men wear these, women oh wear them God, in all the yeah. colors. I mean, everybody, I'd wear that today. It's unbelievably hot watch. Even Rolex made the mistake early on of thinking these precious metal mother of pearl dial watches would be for women because when they equipped them with a rare Rolex factory lizard strap right out of this, you know, right out of the gate, right out of the factory, the straps were all cut short on the assumption that no man was going to wear <laughs> a yellow <laughs> dial, a green dial, a blue <laughs> dial. Absolutely true. So it really was a targeted woman's watch that had mediocre results. And as we all know, nothing makes a better collectible watch than original mediocre results because they really truly are rare. And this really is yellow on yellow on yellow, yellow gold, yellow lizard strap. And what you said about the dial, that it's natural material, no two are ever exactly alike. This is almost like a blazing orange sun. This is almost beyond yellow. There's, there's some red undertones in there that really make this a special piece. I completely agree. And that's the thing that popped when I first saw it. I was like, whoa, what is that? And it just screams at you. It's a big variation in those dials. I always say it about my meteorites. Um, everyone is different, and certain of them just really speak to you. I think that's one of the best examples I've ever seen. Okay, so if this is the blazing sun, that's the fire. This <laughs> right here is going to be the ice. <laughs> Platinum date eight, 36 millimeter, blue Arabic numerals. But what really sets this one apart is it has a dial that can be variously described as a wave dial or a seabed dial. But it uses the signature Rolex Platinum Ice Blue in between the silver waves. So it's there, but it's muted. So this is, truth be told, a little bit of a silly watch. Platinum Ice Blue dial, seabed waves, maybe surface waves. It's hard to say precisely. Radially arrayed, blued numerals. This is an Ice Blue Rolex Platinum dial, but it's a weird one because the Ice Blue exists between the silver waves, depending on your interpretation of the surface or the seabed where you find oysters. It is an amazing piece, and I've always had a big soft spot uh, for platinum watches. One is I like big, heavy watches, and there's nothing that feels more solid than a platinum piece. It's just got that feel to it. Instantly recognizable, twofold. One is the smooth bezel. It kind of stands out, and then that glacier dial, which we always call it. Now, this particular variation is 
10 times over the top for a couple of reasons. It's got the, the most modern bracelet. It's got the big fat buckle, as they call it. It's got the rare dial. And that dial with that dark blue and enamel work is just incredible. And the thing I love about these, and my old boss had what I thought was the best line on selling Platinums. We were you know, selling Rolexes in Greenwich, Connecticut, a very conservative town. And he would always say, well, it has the look of steel without the stigma of low cost. And that, <laughs> that's the selling point. It is stealth wealth that you can Correct. wear. Correct. Super solid, super rare, amazing feel to it. But unless somebody really knew what they were looking at, it just looks like a stainless steel watch. And Rolex often uses nautical motifs uh, in iconic applications. A lot of folks don't realize there's a company called Rola Deco that exists within Rolex that just designs the interiors of Rolex dealers. So if you've wondered where all of those green panels come from, where all of the wave motifs come from, that comes from Rola Deco. Now, that same design is blazing on the dial. This could be an easy glacier ice blue. They could very easily have just done a metallic sunburst, put the numerals in place, and been done with it. But the wave dial is a little bit mysterious, partly because Rolex collectors can't agree on whether we're looking at the bottom of the ocean or we're looking <laughs> or the at top. the top. <laughs> yeah. White caps or bottom floor? I don't know where I'd go on that one. I'd probably lean towards the caps. But what I love about the platinum pieces is they've always done very special dials. I love the fact that they reserve a color of the dial just for platinum. I love the fact that they've always done these unusual variations, whether it's Roman, Arabic, crisscross patterns, this super rare wave dial. They've always done something special to make platinum collectors or customers in general really feel special about that watch because it was the top of the food chain at the time outside of these diamond pieces. And it's also interesting to see how Rolex's attitude towards dial design changes because at the time, the numerals were a different color than the hands. The hands are regular white gold, the numerals are all blued, and there's an obvious disparity there that you don't see as often today, particularly in the date eight forties, uh, where the two are almost always matched together. It's a great point that I didn't even notice until you said it now. You're absolutely right. You would have thought they would have done the blue hands, but no, interesting. And you know, this is nicknamed the president. It's never been called the Rolex president. You go online, you type in Rolex president, Rolex presidential, you're gonna get a picture of this watch. In fact, the bracelet has been called president. The watch was often called president because of its illustrious and frankly, occasionally infamous ownership history. I love that piece. It's a great pick and super rare just got that great feel. And even though it's 36, yes. it wears solid and oh. you know feels good on your wrist. It was the brick before the brick. Correct. For the president or the president for life. <laughs> so you've got one of your own. Tell me a little bit about this. I was gonna say, this. we're gonna go right into day date. So this is a, again, a classic day date, um, but another special dial. I am really have a soft spot for dials in general uh, because really Rolex variations really start at the dial level. And particularly with stones, this is a ferrite dial. It's got the applied uh, Roman numerals. It's got the, you know, you can always tell it's a stone dial with the framing of the date. Uh, so it's done in gold, really recognizable, but very subtle and again, special stone because they're each individual. And cut out, and again, a great condition example. You just don't see these things very often. They would do different stones. They would do different woods over years. And they would kind of come for a year or two and then not make them and then come back for a couple of years. So on and off production. And again, most customers who were buying the day dates back then, it was champagne stick, it was champagne Roman, it was silver stick. And the wild guys would get a black dial. You know, that was kind of your core Rolex. Uh, to see a stone or to see the, the wood, just amazing to me. And what I really like about this, this is your classic late 80s, early 90s power watch. So W code, this is a 1990s watch. And I think for me, this is really iconic of the Miami Beach mogul, the LA producer, <laughs> um, the, the rake of the Riviera, that kind of character. There was a time when this was a serious heavy hitter. Today we think, oh, 36 millimeter, you know, that's either vintage or a woman's watch. This is anything but. No, I mean, considering at the time, I remember late 80s, early 90s, the one complaint you got with selling Rolex was that it was too big because it, the other power watch was a Patek Philippe, oh, yeah. super thin 3919 or an ellipse or something of that ilk or a Cartier, very elegant watch. Uh, you know, a true gentleman wore a gentleman's watch and that's really what it was. And the Rolexes were big and bulky and heavy and, 
you know, that was always the complaint, but you could do anything with them. Uh, but these gold examples were few and far between. And what's really cool about this dial is that when you turn it relative to the light, you see the, the little mineral elements in the stone, but what you don't see is the enormous wave bands that run across the dial. It's almost like there's a second order, a hologram that jumps out at you as you move it through the light. No, absolutely. Every time you look at it, it talks to me differently in different lighting. It looks differently. Even at this angle, it's completely different than straight on. I love that part of the stones. Now you're talking a little bit about big bulky watches that weren't popular in the day. Here is a favorite of mine. Guys, I'm gonna show you this on my wrist. We're doing a lot of <laughs> macro shots for the episode, so I know you've already seen the watch up close, but I'm gonna throw it on my wrist and prove that you can absolutely pull this thing off if you're a tiny guy. This is the 44 millimeter Yacht Master II. Proof that Rolex often goes its own way. They don't use focus groups, they don't follow trends. No one asked for this watch back in 2007. Never. Never, never once. And it's big and it's heavy and I love big watches. I mean, I wear a deep sea I was wearing over the weekend. This thing is just a tank. It's amazing. The only thing I don't love about it is I'm a date cripple, so I don't like not having the date, but it's a great complicated watch. And it's the one really undervalued precious metal sport watch that's left. And the fun thing about it is, it's a really cool piece, technically. Like, a lot of people say, oh, you don't buy a Rolex for engineering or watch Yeah, you do. Th this is the <laughs> most complicated movement Rolex has ever made. It has a programmable mechanical memory. It is both a flyback and a fly-forward chronograph. It's a chronometer. It's got a vertical cut, it's got a column wheel, it's got a three-day power reserve, it's 100 meters water resistant. It is a programmable 10-minute countdown timer and it has a ring command bezel. This was the beginning of the ring command bezel that would later resurface on the Skydweller. This is, to this day, the most complex Rolex movement ever. In a case that is white gold with a bezel that is platinum and a profile that is surprisingly slim under 14 millimeters thick. Now, no one asked for a more complicated Yacht Master. The old one was just fine. And it's about a pound of gold, for God's sakes. I mean, it is heavy and it's a great feel. I've worn them, I think it's awesome. And again, I think eventually this will really catch on and people are gonna be like, you know what, that was an amazing piece that we overlooked for so many years and suddenly they're like, wow, that's a tank you're wearing and I love it. And it's so specialized. Regatta timers are not exactly the meat of the market. They're not a niche. Exactly. Very much a niche. And to do it in a precious metal piece as well. Now the, the yellow gold one always had success because it was yellow and blue and much more common. Uh, coloring. This is just under the radar, but just big, beefy, cool watch. You know, the funny thing about the yellow gold one is that because it had too many colors on like a white dial base, people called it the Clown Master. Which was <laughs> a little, I, I thought it was actually kind of funny. That's a great story. I didn't even know that one. And the, now you know, we'll look at it again. Yeah, Clown but Master. if you want the rarest, you want the white gold. Because when people saw this watch, they had to acknowledge that for all of its exorbitant pricing, it was the only way to get a white metal Yacht Master II for the first couple of years. But in 2013, they came out with a steel model, so the anemic sales of this already uncommon watch dried up entirely. Correct. And there are three different dial variants of the white gold model. There's the original, which is just stick hands in white gold. Mm -hmm. There's the 2013 modification where they're like, okay, well maybe we should make them blue so you can actually read the watch. And then again in 2017, they went with Mercedes hands, they changed the indices a little bit, and it's a different look. And as you get later and later in the production run, the watch becomes scarcer and scarcer. Fewer and fewer people buy very it. Very few are out there. You just don't see them very often. Well, before this thing steals my heart, it's already stolen the show. <laughs> I know you have an emotional attachment to that one, and that's what's fun about these watches, is we do get sucked in. So my last pick, uh, is one I'm sure you will love, and it's one of the, to me, the most iconic. Oh, without a doubt. Uh, kind of sport watches, vintage now, uh, you know, late 60s, early 70s, just an amazing double red sea dweller. This is an incredible watch because A, it's all there. Like, you expect with utility watches from the late 60s, and this is serial number about 1.7 million, so, I think it's like 1,750,000, so we're in about 1968. You buy a watch like this to beat the hell out of it and put it away wet. Absolutely, it's a tool watch and that's really what it was. Um, but this one looks like it was loved and coveted but not really worn and beaten like most of them are. And it's got just the right amount of fade to it. Uh, you know, it's got that loom that's turned colors nice and even. 
The red still pops on it. It's just a great example of truly an iconic Rolex sports watch. And I just love those. You don't see them very often. Uh, you know, the ones that were produced, again, were kept in collections and beaten to death. And as we get further and further and further away, there's fewer and fewer great examples. And this, to me, is just a great example. Yeah, that's the thing about old watches. They're highly non-standard. You can't look at your friend's vintage sea dweller as double red and say, I want one exactly like that. You're not going to find the same generation of the dial. You're not going to find the same condition. Even if the watch is all there, you may not have the same patina pattern. And what are the chances that you're going to have hand patina matched to dial patina? That's the rarest thing, because whenever they would go into service, you know, standard procedure Rolex would change hands. Um, and the match never, never came out the same. So to find one all original, Either it didn't go in or it was kept original, but whatever reason, it's just damn near perfect. And it's a pumpkin patina. There are no marks on the dial, no contact from tools, no oxidation, no water intrusion. Even the case is pretty good. There's no uh, spring bar protrusion. The lugs are nice and yep, shapely. Nice and still, a lot of original well. metal. I would also go so far as to say that what's really, really cool about this watch is not just how intact it is, but how wearable it is. A lot of folks who are sea dweller traditionalists, they say 43 and 44 millimeter sea dwellers are aberrations. The original watch, which should always say so Submariner 2000 on the dial mm -hmm. is going to be a 40 millimeter. And it, this is the purest watch. The last of the 40 millimeter sea dwellers went away years ago. And unfortunately, I mean, that's a story for another day, but the 40 millimeter sea dweller is really defined by the vintage pieces and then the pieces from the 2000s, which was the end of the line before the deep sea, and then the very rare 116600 that was made for three years. But even that watch which is a collectible piece and rare, is harder to find than one this old in this shape. I would agree. Love it. Glad we have it in the collection. I just makes me smile. That's what I love about these Rolexes. Like, no matter how many times I pick it up, this makes me smile. It just brings back something, and I love it. Uh, and such, such a piece, Submariner 2000, pumpkin dial, hands to match the dial base, patina pearl in the bezel. You've got all these vintage features, like an, an enormous plexi that warps the, and distorts the dial. Because again, it's a piece of thermoplastic, not a sapphire. You don't have any of that modern sea dweller nonsense, no huge cases, no cyclops eyes. This is a purist watch in its purest form. And I would even go so far as to say it's more appealing today than it was when it was new. Back then, people looked at it as a utilitarian article. Correct. Today, you could wear this thing to the opera. Without a doubt. It's got great character to it. It's gotten better with age. It really is the total package. I'm not a vintage guy. I got, I got to be honest. Vintage normally leaves me cold, but that thing is red hot. Good luck finding another one like it, but I am happy to have made its acquaintance. <laughs> now, from red hot to mean and green, we have the palm dial. Something completely unprecedented, not the greenness. Rolex has been doing that forever. It's the fact that I can't see the forest for the trees, and I'm loving it. So now what I like about this watch is that, like the Yachtmaster 2, it's completely unnecessary. For years, people had asked for the olive green dial from the smaller Oyster Perpetuals and the Date 840 on a men's watch that was either an OP right. or a Datejust. They said, please, just give us a men's size watch with a green metallic dial, and we will buy it. And Rolex said, well, you know what? We'll give you that, but we're going to make it a little bit weird. <laughs> I hope you like palm trees. Palm trees, yes. Because we've, <laughs> we've heard it called a lot of things. It's got some great nicknames to it. Uh, but it's just crazy. It's two different metallic greens. It's a weird palm or fern-like pattern. I don't necessarily think that I would immediately call this out as a palm tree if Rolex hadn't specifically said, this is a palm dial. Uh, this this is just gorgeous, chaotic, a little bit dissonant because it's not symmetrical, but it's lovely, it's fetching, and I'll tell you, from this distance, you lose it. It's only something you see when you get close. It's amazing because we went from, you know, super vintage to this is one of the most modern pieces we have here, real current production, but again, very few pieces are out in the market, in the wild. I love it because I like it better than the OPs because, again, I love having the date which is great, and it's such a more interesting dial than the OP green. I just think it's got great character. It's kind of that traditional Rolex, I don't know if you call it off green, but it's kind of off green. It's that olive. Um, it's an unusual color that really only Rolex has been able to make super popular. And I don't understand why nobody other brands, you know, every other brand makes a special dial and it all gets copied. This one is truly a unique dial, I think, for Rolex. The other thing that's great, though, is that Rolex, 
when you're a Rolex collector dyed in the wool, when you're a Rolex trained watchmaker, when you're a Rolex lifetime employee at a boutique or at the company itself, they say you bleed green. Green has always been the Rolex corporate color. And I think Rolex, in creating this watch, was thinking, well, what the hell? We've been doing green dials, green bezels, green details for eons. Now green is cool. We're not going to do just another green dial. We're going to do it our way. We're going to make it different. We're going to do something no one else is doing. And you know what? People can take it or leave it. It's going to be a little bit weird. We have a tradition of, shall we say, quirky design choices. They've got the iconic. They've got the eternal. They've got the monumental designs like the sub, the Daytona, and the GMT. But they also give us lapis. They give us stone dials. They right. give us wood dials. And in this case, they give us the entire forest. I love that. And I also think they won't give us this for long. I think this is one of those watches that's going to be a two to three year run, and then it's going to disappear, and then really try to find one. This is something that I promise will be a collectible in 10 or 15 years. Oh, and without a doubt, and there are also a couple of different ways to order this watch. Uh, you can order it with a larger case, you can order it with a fluted bezel, you can order it with a Jubilee bracelet. There are a couple of different ways to order your palm dial, so you've got options. This would be my choice because Follow me here. With a loomed dial in a steel case, this becomes a very sporty take on the Datejust. Add the Oyster bracelet and it's sportier still. Now, you can often get a conical bezel on a steel mm -hmm. Rolex Datejust. I like here that they use the domed bezel profile. So this would be like a 126200 for the domed bezel. And it gives it a little bit of an air de famille with the Oyster Perpetual, with the old bubble backs. It gives it a little bit of a vintage look that you don't expect on a modern Datejust. And I dig that. The sportiest Datejust, but with a little bit of a throwback bezel profile and a dial that I do think is destined for a very short production. Model. And I also love the fact that this is, to me, the simplest form. It's the cleanest, and it draws your eye right to the dial. Whereas the fluted bezel or the Jubilee bracelet, I start seeing that more. Where this, I only see the dial, and I think that's the attraction of that one. Yeah, it's stripped down, it's elemental, it's lean, it's mean, it's green, it's all of those things, and it is a machine. And that is our lap around the crown.